Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship at St. Andrew's United Methodist Church in DeSoto, Missouri. I'm jumping in a little bit early in the service because I want to thank the music ministry of Sunrise Church in O'Fallon, Missouri for making some of their worship videos available to churches during this time of, of pandemic and transition and all of that. And I also want to give a quick word of clarification that the recording of this first song, uh, that it came into being uh, more than a year ago uh, before a lot of the widespread distancing happened. So if you were kind of wondering why there's so many people and why they're close together, well, it was done very, very early uh, in this entire season. Now, that being said, I, I want to say that I am very grateful uh, to be a part of United Methodist Churches that seek to, to utilize all the resources we have, all the talents, the input that we have, so that we can join together in doing just exactly what this next song is going to say, that we can share the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. So with that, I would just say, welcome to worship. As we come to this time of scripture reading and prayer, I, I do have a question. How hard is it to believe a lie? That seems quite the question, you know, on the week after Easter, but how hard is it to believe a lie? Well, it is actually quite easy. Uh, you know, research has shown that it is easier to believe a simple lie than it is to change our minds based on new information. Uh, and, and if this simple lie happens to align with our uh, existing, uh, I don't know, political, social, uh, cultural, religious uh, beliefs or points of view, uh, then that lie is very easy to, to believe. As a matter of fact, I, in many ways, I think that's probably uh, where we get the phrase, don't confuse me with the facts. Again, uh, why of all times after Easter that we talk about these things. Um, well, to set the record straight, which is one of those triggering phrases that begins to create all sorts of thoughts about what is and isn't the truth. Uh, but it wasn't the week after Easter when things like these lies began to, uh, to circulate. It was actually the day of resurrection, a day of victory that also was when people began to spread their own version 
of the news. Now, what am I talking about? Well, it's this story that is told uh, only, actually, in the Gospel of Matthew, the particular intricacies of this story. It's Matthew uh, chapter 28, and it's the first 15 verses of that chapter. And this reading uh, will be from the New Living Translation of the Bible, beginning with uh, verse 1 of chapter 28 of Matthew. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guard shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy, and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped at his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priest what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, You must say, Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole His body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. Very controversial reading, but I think an important reading to hear on this day. Uh, would you join me in a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh! 
young Charles immigrated to the United States, uh, he had promised himself uh, that one day he would be able to uh, help his once wealthy family back in the old country. He would, he would be able to help them to restore their sense of dignity and pride uh, and wealth. Matter of fact, uh, he had a plan. Uh, his early beginnings in the United States were sort of a mixture of wins and losses, a kind of odd jobs, sleeping on the floor, things like that. Uh, he decided perhaps he would just I don't know, the pastures would be greener or whatever it would be, he would be going on to Canada. And so he, went, he moved to Canada. And, and so there he was. Uh, his wins and losses, that kind of happened again. Um, probably this time, though, more losses than wins. And so he finally decided perhaps it was truly best to go back to the United States and perhaps that's where his plan would get more traction uh, or at least less attention uh, that it got in Canada. Now, uh, Charles' plan uh, worked. Uh, well... It just about worked. Uh, he does have some fame, uh, as far as that goes, uh, fame that comes from the phrase Ponzi scheme. Uh, Charles Ponzi spent some years in prison, the United States. Uh, he was deported uh, back to his home of Italy, uh, where he lived in the poverty um, that he so wanted to escape. Uh, there was something about Charles Ponzi uh, that was kind of telling of him uh, near the very end of his life, and it's something that he said about his time in the Americas. He, uh, he said, Without malice of forethought, I had given them the best show that was ever staged in their territory since the landing of the pilgrims. Man, I had given them the best show ever staged. I wonder... I wonder if a thought like that may have been a part of the thoughts that went through the minds of some those days uh, before and right after the crucifixion of Jesus. Was this uh, some show, some way to capitalize on, uh, on what? On the tensions between the government and a people who were being oppressed by the government? Was it uh, who could capitalize maybe uh, you know, on the religious leaders who seemed to always be able to come out on top of things? even if it was at the expense of the poor. Uh, who would it be that would benefit from what probably was going to happen, you know, the uprising that the, that the Roman government saw that was happening? Who would benefit from that or perhaps from the crucifixion that let them know we are still in charge? Who is to benefit from this show? Um, what was the greatest lie in history? Was it a Ponzi scheme? Was it a Chernobyl disaster, a Cuban Missile Crisis? Was it Watergate, a pandemic, a crucifixion? Was it a resurrection? The truth is, a lie is more easily, more easily believed if it happens to be a lie that will allow us to keep things going as it always has been. Um, we approach this season of Easter. I would like for us to consider our lives as life 2.0, uh, as a reboot, as a manner of rethinking uh, what used to be a given. 
And let us consider how the resurrection speaks to many of those questions. For the next few weeks, let 2.0 be a reminder of what following the way of the resurrected Jesus can mean. A part of opening our minds to what the resurrection can mean to us as individuals is to face, I guess you could say, is to face what could easily be called a lie. Now, some would say, well, you know, a lie is kind of a harsh word. Why can't we just use something else? Something, I don't know, a little less painful. Uh, and, I, and I would agree in, in pretty large part. It's just that, it's just that as uh, I've lived these uh, few years of my life, I observe people living with uh, untruths or living with, you know, sort of truths or living with, oh, it's just a little bit of a discrepancy in the fact I, I've, I've seen people live with those things. And if they would have just been simply recognized as the lie that they were, uh, maybe things, maybe life would have been more manageable. Maybe uh, some things could have been avoided in life. And so in this reboot, we recognize that we all come from different stations in life. Our stories are diverse. Our stories are all very important to whom we have become. But maybe, just maybe, there's a part of our lives we would like to restory, uh, to recreate in ways that give life, that give even more life. And what better way to do that than to take a look at fallacies, at things that we want to call something other than what they are, uh, which is a lie. In this story of the resurrection, as found in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, one part stands out to me, and it's verse 15. It says, So the guards accepted the bribe and, and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. A bribe, an untruth, and the need to keep it going. A number of historians have said that Matthew's story of Jesus' life and time on earth was written some uh, 30 to 40 years after Jesus' time on earth. Now, if that is the case, then it says a lot. It says a lot about just how long some people will go on and on about something even when they know it is not true. Uh, what is it that's that said about a lie that, uh, uh, that you have to remember it over and over and over again, but you only have to remember the truth once? Uh, there's even more to this that Scripture tells us. And it kind of tells us what the guards said, or not the guards, but what the leaders said to the guards when they were giving him the bribe. They said, if the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. Did you hear that? This was not just about a bribe. This was about blackmail. How often have the half-truths that we hold on to, how often do they sometimes determine our lives? Uh, I believe it was St. Augustine who said that when regard for truth has been broken down or even slightly weakened, all things remain doubtful. Um, I think it'd be fair question to ask ourselves, you know, exactly these guards, coming back to that story, what choice did they have? I mean, they really didn't. Uh, you know, the whole thing about getting in trouble probably would have meant their death. Um, what where could they go? Where could they go? Well, they could have gone to God. They could have allowed God to recreate in their lives. And some would say, well, I, I don't know that that could work. Well, hang on with me just a moment. Were we to consider the ancient world in that time, I am not so sure that a story about someone being resurrected from the dead would have been that hard to believe. In fact, having a resurrected prophet would have been the very thing that people would have wanted to believe. Well, people who had been oppressed, people who had lost their voice, people who had been written off by the government, uh, uh, people who had been told by their religious leaders, you need to stay in your place. People would have wanted to believe that and would have responded to that. 
in a very real way. Um, I just think the guards didn't think about it. The, the truth of the matter is, paying off the guards and building kind of this good little measure of blackmail involvement, that was really a fairly small price for the leaders to pay. Um, it's just that if that's the way they wanted to be remembered, by the untruths, by the half-truths, by the discrepancies. Um, and it's something we need to look at in our lives. How do we want to be remembered? There's a particular part of our nation's history and the, the scandal history, I guess you'd say, that, that seems to be the scandal by which all other scandals are measured, and, and that scandal is Watergate. Now, I say measured uh, because uh, of the fact that any high-profile scandal or hint of a scandal, uh, it seems that, you know, that hits the news feeds, it seems to have a play on the word Watergate. Uh, you know, Watergate, Bridgegate, uh, Iran gate, climate gate, deflate gate. Uh, yeah, sports have their own gates as well. Uh, and of course, perhaps one of the more recent ones, pandemic gate. I suppose every lie has its gate. Uh, every story, every scandal has its gate. But it causes me to wonder what gates might be opened were we to allow God to restory to recreate our lives. Few people knew of the intricacies of the Watergate scandal better than Charles. I'm not talking about Charles Ponzi. I'm talking about Charles Colson. Chuck Colson went to prison for his role in Watergate. Chuck Colson was thought by some to, to, to simply be yet another person to find jailhouse religion. Chuck Colson was an important part of, of setting up uh, nationwide, worldwide jailhouse ministries. And he was just thought, well, he's just one more jailhouse religion person. But that is not his story. As a matter of fact, I would want you to listen to a story of one writer and how he talks about his time with Chuck Colson. When I first heard Chuck Colson tell the story of his newfound faith, I was among the skeptics. But I soon realized that Chuck's story was not that of a man trying to claw his way back into respectability and success. It was instead a story that saw him returning to the places of his own brokenness and humiliation. I had been a Christian involved in Christian work for a few years by that time, but it wasn't until I went into the prison with Chuck that I really began to know who Jesus is. I met Jesus as if for the first time. This writer went on to say, My eyes and mind and heart were opened as I began to understand the significance of Chuck's story and message, which was all about God's love embracing a world, a broken world, in the person of Jesus Christ. Perhaps the most important reboot, the most vital shift in the stories, is found in this story from Matthew. It's the story of the first messengers. I'm not talking about the angel who rolled the stone. I'm certainly not talking about the guards who, who took the bribe and, and, and kind of had to deal with the blackmail for the rest of their lives, I suppose. I'm talking about the women, the first messengers of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whatever the circumstances were, whomever it was who said, or implied, or hinted that you are not qualified to tell people of the good news of Jesus being alive and alive in you, whatever the circumstances. Uh, it's just not the truth. You know, other gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus, they have the disciples questioning the truthfulness of the women. Uh, granted, a resurrection was kind of an enormously big story. But I wonder if the, the resurrection, the, the questioning about the resurrection didn't have to do with the fact that the first bearers of the news uh, were people not looked upon as having the culture and the religious qualifications to be given, giving out the official word. How might that apply to our own lives? Who, uh, who better than to help the grieving 
than one who has experienced grief. Who better to help the recovering divorcee than the, than the one who made it through the times of separation and dissolution and recovery? Uh, who knows the pangs of hunger better than the one who has experienced those very same aches? Who better to tell a friend about how Jesus can live in them than the friend who has experienced new life in Jesus Christ. Now, we don't lose friends by, by telling what following Jesus means to us. And in many ways, we might learn that our friend said, might say, well, why did you take so long? I thought you were my friend. Which brings me to a very important point today. Uh, there's another part of this story from Matthew that I would like, uh, would like for us all to look at. It's the place right at the end of verse 6 and right at the beginning of verse 7. Okay? Let me read that part for you, and I'm going to begin with verse 6. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead just as he said what happened. Come, see where his body is lying. And now go quickly, and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. Did you see it? Did you hear it? It's the space between the end of verse 6 and the beginning of verse 7. How long was it between the time they saw where the body had been and the angel telling them to go quickly and tell his disciples? Was it five minutes? Was it, was it 15 minutes? Was it one hour? Uh, my guess is that it was pretty quickly, but, but that sort of misses the point. We don't know which is the point. How long was that time? How long will it be before we decide it is time to go and to tell the news and to shake off the fear, the insecurities, to dismiss the lies or the half-truths or the misunderstandings? How long will it take for us uh, to say, I will tell you, I will, I will tell someone what following Jesus means to me. I will tell someone, regardless of the fact that, I don't know, that I've lost my job. Or I can tell someone, uh, when my marriage failed, what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. When I, when I got that diagnosis, when our, when our new baby came, I can tell them what I felt about, when, about following Jesus when all of those things happened. When I got caught in city traffic, when I was praying the other day, when I, was, when I was reading the Bible last night, how long will it take for us to tell someone about, follow, about what following Jesus means in all of those experiences, good or bad, in all of those experiences of life? How long will it take when we say, I need to get rid of the lies, that it's not my place, that I'm not educated enough, or that I'm not this, or I'm too much of that. How long will it take? Now, how does the Scripture say those women left? Some translations say, with fear and great joy. Today's translation says, they were frightened, but also fear filled with great joy. You know, it's okay to be afraid. In fact, uh, what might scare me more if I hear someone say, I'm not the slightest bit afraid. I... Now that kind of scares me a little bit, okay? You know, it's okay to be afraid. Why? Because this is an important story. And allowing God to recreate, to restory in us is a big deal. Because it's a story that gives life. And so, we should hear that angel. And consider what we might have to to move to the side so that we don't have to be afraid and that we can go and tell the story. To remove the lies, to remove the half-truths so that we know that we can tell that story. And so in my most angelic voice, thinking of those words, let me say this. What are we waiting for? Let's get out there and tell the story. Let us pray. 
God of all that is life to its fullest measure. May we overcome the fear, the voices from our past that want to put us down, the mistakes we've made, the lies that we have too easily believed. May we overcome them through the power of the risen Christ in our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being a part of this service at St. Andrews. And, and, and as we... Wait, I'm hearing something. Oh yes, it's an angel telling all of us, what are you waiting for? Get out there and tell the story. That faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Amen. Thou art worthy.